Hey there, thanks for tuning in to Duck Bricks. I'm Chris and welcome to a very special Lego and Bionicle related video. So over the past few days I've been working on a fun side project that is actually tangentially related to one of the courses I'm taking in college, specifically the design for mechatronic systems. Now what I'm trying to create is take a Lego Bionicle figure, take a 3D printed scaled up Lego minifigure, and combine them using the motion from the Lego Bionicle to actually control the motion of the Lego figure. Now I figured that since this is obviously something I am doing a little bit for class but is related enough to Lego, I figured why not just make a full Duck Pricks video on it and actually make this really really cool, put a lot of work into it, and showcase the final project. So that's why I'm here, to walk you through the process of creating what I just showed you, controlling the movement of a giant 3D printed Lego minifigure with a standard Lego Bionicle. So without further ado, let's just jump right in, I'll explain my creation process, and maybe if you're an electrical engineer or someone who just wants to learn a little bit more about circuitry, design, servo motors, and mechatronics, you might be able to learn something from this and maybe even create something like this yourselves. So I hope you enjoy, let's dive right in right now. All right, so let's just get right into this. For this project, I essentially wanted to control this giant 3D printed Lego minifigure by moving the arm and head of the Lego Bionicle buildable figure toy, specifically Toa Kopaka from 2001. Now, I had originally had some other plans for this, such as creating a giant 3D printed Great Spirit robot to control, but unfortunately, I just ran out of time because I essentially had a day and a half to make this, so I figured why not just cut my losses and still create something fairly cool from what I had around me. So, to do so, I had to draw from the existing library of LEGO Part 3D models. LDraw is a really great site that categorizes a ton of different LEGO elements, and a lot of existing LEGO pieces are already fully 3D modeled there. From LDraw, you can actually export these 3D models as STLs, which are basically the file format you're going to want to be manipulating to either modify the CAD model or computer-aided design model, as well as actually 3D print the model itself. So essentially, I took the standard Bionicle Toa Mata Torso and created mounts for the specific controls I wanted to use to actually create input for my movement. For the input, I use a device called a potentiometer. This is usually something that just reads in exactly what values you're actually twisting the long stem of the potentiometer to be. So I had to take this, which was one of the smallest components I could get for the control aspect, and figure out how to implement it into the Bionicle 3D part number. So I took LEGO part ID 32489, which is the standard 2001 Bionicle Toa Torso element, and brought it into my 3D modeling software of choice, Rhino. From there, I used a site called Snap EDA to find the exact potentiometer model I needed and import the STL file into Rhino. For those of you who don't know, Snap EDA is basically the Eldra of just electrical components. If an electrical component exists out there, the odds are very, very high it's already been 3D modeled on Snap EDA. All you have to do is search up the part number and you can find the exact part you're looking for. So this was really helpful because immediately in my 3D environment, I had the exact scale of the Toa Mata Torso and the exact scale of the potentiometer I was using to control the input. So that already allowed me to have this playground to figure out exactly how I wanted to mount these. So as you can see here, the control input of the body piece is basically at this one-to-one -one scale for traditional Lego parts, and I had to modify it to include the potentiometers. This allowed me the ability to enhance the appearance of this control robot with, of course, off-the-shelf Lego bricks, and just taking the pieces from the Toa Kopaka 2001 set and implementing it in this 3D model. To me, it was really important to retain the original shape and look and feel of this torso element while only making a few minor modifications to actually fit the potentiometers. So from there, basically, I just created a few mounts, had to change the tolerances a little bit to make sure I could 3D print it all okay, and the next step was then to 3D model the potentiometer to Lego Axle Converter. So I wanted to sketch this out first to make sure I got it right. For those of you who haven't used potentiometers before, they're really, really small. They're actually really tiny pieces, and it's kind of hard to twist the potentiometer pin right there. So I wanted to make it such that when I actually move the arm, or the axle in this case, of the arm or the head of Kopaka, it would actually twist the potentiometer reliably. And as such, I had to create a very, very precise adapter to attach the Lego Technic axles to the potentiometers themselves. 
So after a few rounds of 3D printing this and modifying it, again, I would recommend using the Prusa i3 Mark III as simply the best 3D printer I've used. It's very cheap, very affordable, and honestly, prints better than some of the massively expensive 3D printers. This printer, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but the Prusa i3 Mark III S only costs around $500. I have used a $20,000 3D printer at my college, and I've got to say, the Prusa is better. So if you want to get into 3D printing, just get a Prusa. And trust me, you'll thank me later. Anyways, getting back to the project, once this whole Technic axle adapter to potentiometer model was completed, I then 3D printed the torso to test the compatibility with LEGO elements. Of course, this took a few tries to get 100% right because 3D printer tolerances are of course not nearly as precise as actual LEGO elements. So now, with the input done, I then needed to 3D model the output. I then had to take the standard 3D file for a LEGO minifigure, which thankfully already existed on the internet. Thanks to a site called Thingiverse, which is a compendium of existing 3D models created by people out there, I was able to find a large scaled up LEGO minifigure and import it into Rhino. All I had to do was make a ton of modifications and actually scale it to accommodate two servo motors, as well as be the right scale I wanted. But this was a great starting point, because I definitely did not have the time to model a LEGO minifigure from scratch, no matter how fun that may sound. So what I had to do then is take the minifigure body and import the exact servo I was using as a 3D model. Now, after researching it later on, it turns out that someone's actually created the 3D model for this servo already. But I was kind of on a time crunch as mentioned, and I just simply didn't have time to find it. So I figured, why not just use a pair of digital calipers, which are really precise measuring tools, and just 3D model the servo itself. Of course, this wasn't anything actually good looking. I just basically threw together a rectangle and a few cylinders and the actual lever to actuate the servo, but it did the trick and actually allowed me to pretend play around with a 3D model of a servo motor while actually designing the torso of the creature itself. So I took the minifigure here and took two different servo motors and I said, I'm gonna control one with the arm and one with the head. And then it was a matter of figuring out, well, how exactly do I make these fit together? The arm, you can't really have it stick out of the body. So that was the priority, getting the servo motor to be embedded well within the torso as easily as possible. Again, unfortunately, I was on a time crunch, so I couldn't really go that big with this. In fact, I only had six 3D printers available for me to use, and each of the pieces I was printing would take around two to three hours. I had to get this done in a matter of a few more hours than that, so I just had to suck it up with the smaller scale and try to find a way to actually make it work and still allow the motors to fit in. And then thankfully, I was struck by inspiration. Since this is around Halloween, why not just scale up the Lego minifigure head, pretend it's a pumpkin head, and that way it would make sense that it's so much larger than the actual body for scale. This would allow me to mount both motors in a semblance of a somewhat realistic manner and still allowed the full degree of articulation that I wanted. When all was said and done, both figures were approximately 170 millimeters tall because I specifically wanted to scale the figure to be around the same size as Toa Kopaka, and the motors and potentiometers were fully mounted exactly where they should be. The next step for the second part of this was to fully wire up everything around these 3D prints and LEGO models. So, moving past a few other measurements of the different build models and 3D models that I used for this, I then had to just wire everything up, which thankfully was not too too hard because I tried to make the torso as hollow as possible to allow me to snake wires in and out. But then came the hard part, actually creating the code for this. Now, the code is actually written in the C language. This is actually what is typically used for just robotics and mechatronics in general, which is why I wanted to actually figure out how to do this for an application like this. The code was fairly involved and honestly took almost a full day of trial and error to just figure out what I was doing wrong. In the next part of this video, I'll actually go a little bit more in depth into how I actually figured out this code and how I wired it up. So definitely check that out if you are interested in this sort of thing and maybe want to create this on your own. I do understand that this may be a little bit technical, so I'll try to explain this as clearly as possible, but also not take up too much of your time. But now let's just jump right into the demonstration of our thing working.
So here we've got my setup right here. I have got the Bionicle figure, specifically Kopaka Toa of Ice, and my 3D printed large scale Lego minifigure. The text that says Meme 510 is actually for one of my college classes, a mechatronics class, which I was originally developing this for and decided to actually go a little bit further and make this a full duck bricked video because it was just kind of a cool thing to show. So I'm gonna plug in power to the motors right now so you can see it fully working. What's really cool is you can see as I rotate Kopaka's head here, I have a motor inside the 3D printed body that actually spins the head as it should. And the same goes for the arm. So this Bionicle is fully controlling the Lego minifigure as it should be. Bionicle is the master, of course. And you can see all of the movements are actually copied exactly one-to-one -one with how I rotate this head. So a lot of interesting applications for this. I originally wanted to do something that was related to the Bionicle Great Spirit robot and have a Bionicle figure controlling a much larger thing, but I just didn't get the 3D model, the GSR in time, so I figured that using a minifigure was the next best option. And yes, the face is supposed to look like a pumpkin head. I am not an artist, so take that as you will. I was also on a bit of a time crunch for this. Had to throw this together in like two days. So in the back here, if you actually are interested in electrical engineering or want to know a little bit more about this, you can see all the way in the back here, I've got this oscilloscope set up. As I move the arms and whatnot, the duty cycle will change. So duty cycle for the yellow one, which is Kopaka's arm here, is at 10% right there. I'm gonna move it a little bit higher, gonna bring it up to 8% and so on. So that's actually how I'm tracking the motion here. The oscilloscope is really powerful because I can read in the exact square wave that is actually being used to control the servo. Um, what is useful about this is because this actually allows me to visualize and help debug if anything was going wrong. For instance, I had an issue with these servos at one point, but all of the values I was reading in from the potentiometers here, which you can see are right there, were reading in correctly from the oscilloscope in the back. So I realized it was just a power issue to these servo motors themselves and not something wrong with my code. I've also got this little debug line here set up. You can see I'm reading in the ADC values for each of the potentiometers. So as I move, say, the arm here, you'll notice the ADC values are actually changing, which is actually a pretty cool thing to track and lets me know that I'm doing it right. Specifically, I'm using the ADC value right here, ADC5. Uh, and if anyone's an electrical engineer here, probably will understand exactly what this means, but I'm getting the full range of the motion of the potentiometer from zero all the way up to around 1023. It's a little easier when I turn his head. <laughs> Sorry, Kopaka, gotta break your neck a little bit here because you can really see the ADC values going 1023 like so. And as I turn it all the way around, we're gonna get all the way down to zero on the ADC6 value there, which actually shows that the potentiometer is reading in the exact level of motion, which actually does take a significant bit of coding uh, and design and whatsoever. So in the back here, you've actually got the circuit. I have this all hooked up almost like in the Iron Man scene where they had to create the Iron Man robot but had to hook up a massive external battery to it. That's kind of what this one feels like. A lot of different circuitry and whatnot mixed around in here. I'm actually gonna turn the motors off for now just so I can show you this a little bit more clearly. So I've got this set up here, a few potentiometers here to help debug, but for the most part, this is just uh, probably a little bit more complicated than it looks. I'm using a teensy board right here to read in all of the input. These gray readers here are connected to the oscope or the oscilloscope to actually read in my values. And I've also got a ton of other wires here that actually all connect up this whole circuit. So the way this works are these servos inside the Beam 510 little minifigure here are powered separately from the TNC by this external uh, battery pack right here. The signals to the servos are actually going through op amps, which are set up in the follower or buffer mode to help with the signal for the servos. These op amps in buffer mode help amplify and pass the otherwise relatively weak signal from the teensy to the servos themselves. So if anyone wants to actually try this at home, one of the major problems I personally was facing was that I was reading in all the values okay when I was actually designing this figure and moving the potentiometer, but the servos were just either not moving or being really jerky. As it turns out, it was just because this was not able to send a powerful enough signal to the servos by itself, which is why I have to set up the op amps in the buffer mode. 
The other thing is that the source signal robot uses these particularly long unshielded wires. They were literally just the wires I had laying around. They're also really easy to actually hook up around the 3D print of the Mata torso here. So there was a reason why I used these really skinny ones. But they're really long, they are completely unshielded, and they kind of act like antennas and pick up crosstalk and electrical noise. So because of this, I had to introduce a low band filter for the servo control signals to essentially cut down on this high frequency noise. If you're curious, you can see a schematic of that right here. I'll throw it up on screen again if anyone wants to try to replicate this themselves. Additionally, I added some larger capacitors at around 47 to 100 UF to each of the power supplies, uh, V1 and V2, which are specifically for interfacing with both the Teensy as well as the power rails to each of the servos. That being said, each of the servos do share a common ground, as does the Teensy, to avoid any odd floating ground issues or noise. Now, one note that I do want to make, again, for people who do want to recreate this themselves, these servo motors only respond to the full range of motion from around 3% duty cycle to around 14%. The bottom blue line is the head here. So the blue line is the head for the duty cycle, 14. I'm going to move the head all the way around this way, and we're going to get down to 3%. So just make sure you account for that change in the duty cycle if you do want to hook up these servo motors yourselves to something like this. This also dramatically cuts down on the sensitivity, given that ADC converters can only actually go from 0 to 1023. So there was a range of math that I essentially had to calculate here to translate the motion of the potentiometers, which are the blue parts in here, to the actual servo motors, which are built into the minifigure itself. So if you want more details, because the duty cycle is the whole number, this means that the OCRXA value ranges from around 268 to 302, while the ICRX value is around 15,625 Hz divided by 50 Hz, which gives us 312 to get us that 50 Hz carrier signal that the servo particularly operates at. So essentially, for sensitivity, assuming I have 180 degrees of motion, Every change to the duty cycle is around 180 degrees divided by 302 minus 268, which is 5.29 degrees per increment, which equates to around 302 minus 268, 34 increments. So again, if you actually want to do this yourself, I would highly recommend to actually look into this because you can have this issue of trying to translate the exact motion. That was probably one of the hardest things you can see, just getting the arm to move perfectly right when I move it up and down here and actually getting the degree of freedom, you're probably going to have to play around with it just a little bit to make sure that this gets 100% right. But honestly, it's really worth it in the end, at least where I consider it. So again, I mitigated some of the noise from the potentiometers translating to the motors by specifically using low pass filters via control or signal lines. And honestly, that's probably all you need to know in terms of how to actually create this yourselves. Now, of course, I will be answering any questions in the comments if you wanna actually build some of these. It's using very cheap materials for the most part, so it's actually fairly simple to build. If you do have a 3D printer at home, I would recommend the Prusa i3 Mark 3S, just a fantastic printer. Although I did have to use the Makerspace printers and a local Makerspace that I use for this one because I was just on a time limit and I really just had to get about 20 different pieces printed all at once. This piece, however, was printed by my personal Prusa at home and works out very well. Now, in terms of the other pieces, potentiometers are incredibly cheap. Same goes for the servo motors inside these particular figures. And all of the wiring here and circuitry can really just be done on the cheapest possible materials. You got your breadboard. The Teensy maybe will set you back a few dollars, but it's really not too expensive, especially if you're a student. You can probably get student discounts on stuff like this. And the rest of these are just common electrical engineering parts that you probably will have lying around anyways. The oscilloscope is probably the most expensive thing of this lot, and you really don't need it unless you plan to significantly debug this, but if you set it up the way that I've set it up in my circuit diagram, you could probably do this yourself without the oscilloscope at all. I really do hope you enjoyed this. This is a bit of a departure from the usual DuckBritz videos, but I just kind of wanted to showcase something that I did remotely related to LEGO for a class project and take it a little bit further to actually do a full video on it. So. All right, I hope you enjoyed this special look at a fun little side project slash college project that I'm working on for one of my courses. Thank you all so much for tuning in and definitely let me know down in the comments below if you're inspired to create something like this yourselves or if you've done something like this before. I definitely am 
interested to hear any and all tips you may have. This is one of my first times working with the particular programming language and kind of trying to piece this all together from scratch and actually hardwiring everything myself. So would definitely appreciate any and all feedback if you happen to know stuff about this yourselves. And I thank you all so much for watching. Definitely stay tuned to Duck Breaks for more Lego news reviews discussion and I guess random Lego related videos like these coming your way very soon. Thank you so much and bye bye for now.